It's real. That's how real it is. I think somebody's trying to kill me. I'll be waking up paranoid. I'll be really scared. I'll just be paranoid. <laughs> That's just the way I am. You know. <laughs> you be seeing me. Scared to death. Did Biggie at all feel that his life was in danger? Um, he never told me, I can only speak, he never told me he felt that his life was in danger. I think somebody was trying to kill me. I'd be waking up paranoid. I'd be really scared. I'd just be paranoid. This is Big Gene from Raw Deal, The Last Big Night, and The Three Chronicles. Now with the cooking show, uh, cooking and conversation on the Gene Deal show that's on YouTube. Uh, we're here in honor of the notorious B.I.G., Biggie Smalls, who lost his life in a hell of bullets on March the 9th in California, outside the Peterson Museum. Uh, I'm here with Biggie Coogee sweater on, and this is also Biggie's shirt that he would wear, his uh, sweatshirt that he would wear from his, his, his uh, clothing line, Brooklyn Mint. That right there says Notorious Big right there. Uh, these are the shoes that he wore on his Soul Train, his last performance on Soul Train, which is actually my shoes. And uh, I let him use those uh, in his last performance. Uh, I hope you don't mind me using this sweater. I never put it on before. And it's kind of eerie feeling of me putting it on now. but. I want to really go in depth with some things that I didn't speak about to you guys regarding the death of Notorious Big. For those who want to criticize me for coming out and telling the truth, uh, what would you do if you had to spend a day with one of the greatest lyricists, the greatest songwriter, and he entrusted you with some of his personal matters, some of his deepest dark secrets of success and betrayal. How would you feel if you had to look that man's mother in her eyes after he was gunned down in the streets of California? When you pulled him out the car that he was murdered in. Who would you turn to? Who would you look for guidance, counseling, help? To save you from the pain that you had inside yourself. That you knew. That you could have saved his life. Or you could have stopped it that particular day. What would you do? How would you feel? How would you feel? What would you do if you hunted, if you was haunted by the same man and his money that led this kid to his death? So, I came here today to tell you about the biblical betrayal of the notorious big. There's some things that I didn't get, in, I didn't, I, I didn't enlighten the people of regarding the big's big's death, and prior to we getting to that point. So people think that I didn't take every step as a security person to do what need to be done to save people of our crew. First and foremost, let's state, we should never have been in California six months after Pop died. When Wolf, Anthony Wolf Jones heard this was happening, he himself told Puff, Sean Puffy Combs, Diddy, AKA Brother Love, whatever you want to call him, that I'm not going to California unless we go out there right, that we have enough security. Enough security would have been him, 
with two tour bus loads of guys that he wanted to bring out, bring out there to make sure that everybody get home safe. At least the stars, the entertainers. Now, I don't know a place that we ever went to if Wolf said we're going to leave or not be there or not go. But for some particular reason, Puff had to be in California. And nobody could have stopped him. So when I got the itinerary, like I said before, I called Kirk Burroughs. I told Kirk Burroughs. I had spoke to Wolf also. Wolf told me he wasn't going. Kirk Burroughs assured me that we was just doing studio, the Soul Train, the video, and that was it. That we wasn't hanging out to no parties, no clubs. And I said that in Raw Deal 1, 2, and 3. So, some things happen out there that you may not be aware of, you know what I'm saying, that I didn't get in depth to, but I may piece it together. And the reason why I call this the biblical betrayal of Biggie, because when you look into it, it was almost Christ-like. <laughs> I know you're saying, yo, Gene, you lost your mind, you've gone crazy. But at the end of this, you look back at it and see what I'm talking about. We were shooting Hypnotize, and that's the day I spent, spent with Big. And that's the only day I ever spent with Big alone. And somebody probably say, yo, how we know you spent that day with Big, or how we know what you're saying ain't true is a lie. Because I repeated his, the conversation he had with his mother. Everything that was said that to his mother, he was on his phone, mother phone by hours about their house, you know, uh, uh, that he was getting built for her out there in Pennsylvania. So I repeated everything that he was saying to her, and he just kept on saying, "Yes, ma, yes, ma, uh huh." What she, what he was going to take care, of, what he was going, the money he was going to send, all that. I even told her about the contracts. One that I had read on the plane coming uh, to California, the Puff gave me his uh, briefcase, and I read the contract. I even told her about uh, stuff that I knew that he, he he owed other people that he was talking about. His contracts with I think it was either Atlantic or Capital for 62 million. His groups. I was I told his mother everything. So. You're wondering, why was I with Big that particular day? And that always chased, that, that always ran through my mind. Because Puff and I, like I said before, was going all over California. This particular time, he took D-Rock with him. Now, I said, and I never thought two cents about it back then because Puff was like, yo, Gene, stay with Big. You know, I know Rock wasn't carrying no weapon. You understand? And uh, I was the only one that came from New York out there with a weapon. Unless uh, G Money, I think G Money was living out there or something like that. Unless G Money gave them a weapon. I didn't know of any weapon they even had. So, I came out there with three weapons myself. You know, I've named them before. <coughs> Nini, Nene, and Nina. You know, sometimes I would carry five weapons. So, this one particular day, after the hypnotized video and everything like that, before we had shot a part and we was going to shoot later on that night, about 7 or 8 o'clock, uh, D-Rock and Puff was gone for the whole day with those girls that was on that boat. And that was Sally Richardson, one of her stylists, and some other, they, they was gone. And that was something that Puff never did. I, I never seen Puff just chill with D-Rock like that. 
Because that whole time that we were out there, uh, Big, like I said this before, Big and D-Rock, C's, none of them never came to none of the parties we were at. So, after the incident with Big and Charlie Baltimore, and I spoke about that before, uh, we were in the studio one day. And this was prior to going to the Vibe party. And I was talk talking to D-Rock, and D-Rock was talking to me. He was expressing, you know, how, you know, you know with the Snoop situation, uh, with um, how Puff keep calling them and they dodging him in the whole nine yards. And I said, I understand. I see, man. He always act. He always, he always saying, yo, he looking for y'all at the different places, like the House of Blues, where he's at, whatever club, whatever party. Uh, when he was going just chilling, you know, out for drinks or whatever, he looking for y'all to be there. And then I, I hear him barking at Big, talking about you're not using the studio time that he set up for him. You know what I'm saying? So, but I thought Big album was done. So D-Rock, like, yeah, I know, man. We ain't, we ain't fucking around out here, man. You know, he made it very clear to me that they was not going to go to none of the parties. And I told him, yo, dog, you shouldn't. You know what I'm saying? It ain't safe like that. I don't know why y'all think it's sweet. We had this conversation. Me and D-Rock had this conversation. And he assured me that he wasn't going to go. And they wasn't going anywhere. Yo, we were so deep into the conversation, D-Rock lit up an L. And he started smoking it. And I grabbed it and passed him a Newport and started smoking the L too. And he looked at me. He said, yo, Gene, that's an L. I said, I don't give a fuck what it is, bro. I'm letting you know it's like that, man. And D-Rock was like, yo, I know, man. We ain't fucking around. We ain't fucking around. And so then I gave, you know, Star Smoke said we was talking. I said, yo, listen here, man. Don't tell nobody I took no hit off that shit, man. You know, I'm just letting you know. And he shook my hand, gave me his hand. And everything was told. He said, yo, man, I ain't saying nothing to dog. Your dog said, yo, on everything I love, he said, on everything I love. He even said, on everything from my man from North Carolina. He had, he had said, on my, on my nigga from North Carolina. I guess he thought I had knew him. It was, I guess the dude was a junior mafia. He was a kid that big them knew. You understand? He said it. So, we goes back into the, uh, we goes back into the uh, studio. Because at this time, Puff was making, wanted big to put Charlie Baltimore on some music, you know, so you know they could squash out all that shit. So he was making certain kind of promises to her because of the incident that they had at the Four Seasons Hotel. So I think I went up front to check the front and everything. I came back, puffing big, them was all in the studio and everything like that. And Big said to himself, yo, Puff, I need some more security. I need security. And Puff said, bruh, I got Gene here for you. On right there at the studio. And then Big, I guess he was setting it up, because D Rock had already told him that I blew an L with him. D Rock told Big. He said, he must have told Big, because Big said, Yo, Gene? Yo, Gene is back outside blowing L's with D Rock. And I was I looked at this nigga D Rock. And I was like, Nah, <laughs> this nigga ain't said that to uh, Big. It hadn't been 15 minutes that this man that gave me his hand shook my hand and said, yo, he was going to hold that to himself. And of course he didn't. Puff said, nah, I don't believe that shit. Gene ain't smoke. Gene don't smoke no weed. He said, yo, Gene, you were smoking weed with D-Rock? I said, I don't know what he talking about. And then Big said, D Rock, he asked D Rock again, yo, D Rock, did Gene uh, uh, blow an L with you? And D Rock said, word to that man, that dude again uh, from North Carolina that had passed and everything like that. And like that. He said, nah, Puff said, I don't believe that about Gene. I said, so my thing about it is now nah, I'm going to get it off the subject. I said, oh, Big, you want to talk? Because me and Big, I spent the whole day with him. Here it is. I didn't know it at the time, but 
I was talking to a man that thought he was going to die. Or knew he had death coming at him. Because all the things that he was telling me about the Junior Mafia, Little Kim, you understand? All the things that he was talking about, what he was planning to do with the groups that he had, what he was planning to do in his life. It was like, he was using me as some kind of vessel to vent all his hopes and his dreams that he really didn't see because he knew or he felt he had death on him. I think somebody was trying to kill me. I'd be waking up paranoid. I'd be really scared. I'd just be paranoid. <laughs> Little Kim, he said, Yo, I love Lil' Kim. That's my bitch. From a whole nother vernacular point of view, he's saying, yo, no matter what, me and Lil' Kim gonna always be together because we gonna always be close because I got a love for her that I don't have for nobody else. I said, yeah, I can tell because you wrote that shit, huh? He said, yeah, I wrote that shit. He said, but I could never say that to Diddy. Because he owns my marketing, my publishing. I stated that before. I'm not going to go into that. Lil' Kim was like his Mary Madeline. You understand? That was his Mary Madeline. He said the Junior Mafia. He said right now. There's only one. That I'm thinking about kid, kid. I know I'm going to keep and that's little C's. Everybody else is going to have to work for their position. They got to do right because this is a business now. So they're going to have to do their own writing. They got to show that they want to be here. Because I can't be mad at the nigga Puff because Puff showed me how to get money. So I'm going to show them. But they got to be willing to work. Those was his disciples. But he said... There was some betrayal going in between them. Because he said, Money L don't know that I know. That he's sliding off with Lil' Kim. I was like, oh, shit. That's what he said. But it's all right. Because that's always going to be my bitch. So that's the way he felt. He never mentioned anything or said anything about D-Rock because that's his man. He was part of the Junior Mafia, but, you know, he wasn't no rapper or nothing like that. He just made sure everybody and everything was, you know, the way Big wanted to be. But what he didn't know, that D-Rock Damien Butler had just wrecked and left with the real Damien. And that was Diddy. This is where the caper comes into. Diddy had already convinced Big to do the business in California. We got to go to California. Six months after Pac died. We got to go to California. It was no reason. Give it a year or two. Give it some time. You know, the business still going to be the same. It was going to be, it was no reason. But he got him there. Just like the devil told Jesus he had to go to Jerusalem. To preach the gospel. He wasn't ready for that. Herod was not letting him get down with that. So, you know, they wasn't. They wasn't ready for that. But now, D-Rock is in the hands of Damien himself. That's Diddy. For that whole day. It was a setup. I got to convince somebody in Junior Mafia who has the power to move Big. To have the power to convince Big. 
that we got to go to that vibe party. I'm going to break it down to y'all to how I know it may have been D-Rock who convinced Big to go to that party. Now, if Big did that itself, I put my hands up and I apologize. The way I talked to Big, and I was telling him, man, we shouldn't be going nowhere when we talking in that Winnebago. He made it clear to me that they wasn't going nowhere. How you supposed to have been in London? That because of his financial situation, he had to come out there and do that shit for Diddy. See, what y'all didn't know, at the time of Big's death, Diddy, Big was broke. I told y'all about the fact that he had to get his contract to 60000 and he was going to stop building on his mother's house. So to come out there and work on Diddy's album and do what he needed to do, because the video was shot and everything like that. After we did that Sunday night, we shot, you know, could have left. But that's the business that he chose because he needed to borrow that money, like I said before, from Puff. So now... We've had this conversation. I'm going to fast forward back over into the studio. When I said to Big, oh, now you want to talk big? You want to tell shit? Tell Puff how you wrote Lil' Kim shit. Puff started jumping up and down. You did what? You told him what? I said, yeah, he told me he wrote Lil' Kim shit. He said, say it. He jumped up in big face. He like, let me hear you say it. Just say it once. Said once, told you big, already told me he owned his marketing and his, and his publishing. So, I explained that in Raw Deal 2, 1, 2, or 3, you know what that meant. He jumping around, told me, yo, just say it, just say it. Big, just, you know, one eye went that way, the other went the other way. And he was like, oh, man, look at, and that's the first time I ever heard him call him Diddy. Ah, oh, Diddy. Go ahead with that, Diddy. Go ahead with that, Diddy. And it didn't catch to me what he meant by Diddy until Puff left off the room. And I remember, like I said, playing Donkey Kong. And the little monkey that comes out at the end is his little nephew, and he Diddy Kong. And that's when I said to Big O, so uh, what is it? He Diddy, you Donkey? Yeah, look at you, man. And I looked at D-Rock. I'm like, yo, my man, for real? For real, Rock? So now, all this has been staged and set. Puff got D-Rock in his grasp using the girls that was with them to convince him, yo, y'all got to come to this party. We're going to make sure y'all have a good time. I can see him because I've seen him operate. I've been around him for years. So I've seen this man operate. And I know when he got them to that party, that's all he needed. For whatever reason, and we know the reason why now. Because somebody got to die. Somebody got to die. And it couldn't just be no regular security guy. Because they could have killed either one of us at any time. It had to be somebody. And I really believe today the way the business was transpired and the way the shit went big was Jesus Christ. And they used his own man to be his Judas. We at the vibe party. 
D Rock comes over to me. And this is how I know it was a difference. See, you gotta watch people's behaviors. Lil C's was doing the same thing he always do. Laughing, joking, and smoking. Laughing, joking, smoking, drinking, going to get girls. The whole, did the same thing he always did. But it was one person that didn't smoke, didn't drink. Stood on the side and just watched big. And that was D-Rock. See, what a lot of y'all didn't know was, is that most of the time, when I was sitting behind Big, I was the one with the number four. The black shirt with the number four with the glasses, a lot thinner. I had my gun out. Here, blocked by my hand under my shirt, or in my back like this. I wasn't playing that. D-Rock didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't do anything. Why? I always wanted to ask him this question. I even tried to set up meetings with him when he came home after the incident that he had at Hot 97. We had the same barber. On two occasions, he set up to meet me and never showed up. I can understand that he got businesses, but then I'm calling him like he owed me child support or something. Well, that might not be a good thing because all the mothers out there talking, nah, what do you mean I owe you child support? No, I'm calling this man like he owed me something. So his number didn't even work no more. So I guess he gave me a burnout number. I even went to the barber and told the barber. And then the barber must have got tired of me asking him. He, he told me, yo, um, I don't know. I guess Rock ain't meeting up with you. And then I caught a case out there in Jersey. So some of my people reached out to Puff and him. And they said they wasn't fucking with me. Didn't have a problem with that. Didn't have a problem, didn't have issue with that. You know, because what Puff didn't know that he was telling people I was trying to get at him and people right up under his, the, the manager of Danity Kane, people who was doing book deals and they had book companies with Karen Hunter and everything like that. They was offering me deals and they, they just as much as friends they are mine. And I told you this before. I ain't turning down nothing but my motherfucking collar. Because I know he the way he does business, he not going to let none of that shit bad come out about him. He going to fight all that. I've, I've seen him operate like that before. So for all you guys who said, yo, well, never, he never said nothing to D-Rock, I reached out with D-Rock. Too many times. He cannot get in front of nobody and say, I never try to reach out to him. Because I wanted to know, what did he change your mind? Or did them girls change it? Who changed your mind? Who changed your mind to come to that vibe party? And that's real important. I'm not saying Big wouldn't have, they wouldn't have got him some other time. Or nothing else would have never happened. But I know they was not supposed to be there. And that night he knew they wasn't supposed to be there. And he had did something wrong. Because D-Rock usually smoking with Big. He usually drinking with Big. He ain't do none of that. I ain't just saying this right now. I said it in the last video. D-Rock ain't drink none and didn't smoke nothing. D-Rock came over to me and D-Rock said to me, he said, yo, Gene, I ain't never seen you look like this. What's up, bruh? I said, yo, yo, Rock, these niggas is coming at us tonight. And Rock said, yeah, all right, man, I got you. He stayed to the right side of Big 
like looking at Big the whole time, didn't take his eye off of him and didn't move. Rock ain't drink nothing. Rock ain't smoke nothing. He kept his eye on Big the whole time. You understand? And I was behind Big. He knew. Damien, Diddy, had led him astray to bring his man into that vibe party. He knew that. And he knew he was wrong. He came over to me. He said, Gene, I ain't never seen you like this before. I said, nigga, this shit could go down at any time. I gave Paul one of my guns. He had one of my guns. At that given time, he was Biggs Judas. He was the only one that was different. Didn't drink, didn't smoke. Kept his eye on his man. He knew that nigga Puff set him up. He knew that nigga Puff had them girls. They stood out there. They, they, they stood all day gone. Big in the motherfucking Winnebago talking to this nigga here because he had nobody else to confide in. Or he felt that way. Or he knew if they take me from this earth, somebody was going to stand tall. Somebody was going to tell the truth what happened. Somebody was going to let everybody know how the notorious big lost his life. When we stood down there and we did that U-turn and we got back to that car, D-Rock sees Paul all of them was coming back to the car. D-Rock looked over in the car, grabbed his head, and said, oh, they didn't got my man. He said, they got my man. I always wanted to know. Why was it so important after you being a, you being a street guy? You know y'all don't have the security. Y'all don't have the, the, the gun power. You in enemy territory. Why was it so important for y'all to come to that party that night? We haven't stopped that. It don't stop there. When we was waiting and Puff was running back and forth outside, going to get girls, talk about Gene, remember her, the same shit he was doing in the party. That's something that we never did, never happened before, ever, at any party. He was doing that shit upstairs. Now, you see a couple of pictures, Puff right there, Sitting down, half most of the time, me and Big was over there by ourselves. Him, Stevie J, running around the party, and me and Big was right there. A couple of girls may come over, like I said before. Keefy D, a couple of Crips came over. A couple of Bloods came over with death row penance. Talk about, they ain't care about all the bullshit. 
It's about the music and shit. Yeah, all right, whatever. You know what I'm saying? I'm not caring about that. Because my whole thing about it is, yo, I'm getting home. I'm going back home. And I'm trying to make sure everybody around us go back home. So now, we're outside. And we just blowing time. For what? For what? When the Muslim guy, Amir Muhammad, walked up to the car. I didn't know who it was at the time. I had no name on it or nothing like that. For all you people, the LAPD has a picture. And I'm not talking about no, no, no uh, lineup. I'm talking a picture, a photo. Of me, Puffy, and the Muslim guy in the photo. So, when people go and talk and, and ask, "Well, are you talking about a Muslim guy?" Don't get it. Don't get it mixed up. I never saw the Muslim guy shoot the gun. I never saw the Muslim guy pull the trigger. I seen him walk in the direction, and five minutes later, Big was killed in that same direction. And nobody had walked down the street back and forth other than him and a guy in a blue and white shirt. So, they had that photo. Like I said before, but the face was blurred out. And they were supposed to come back and show it to me within two weeks or send me out there or whatever for a lineup. They never, ever did it. I don't know if it was a mistake or whatever, them showing me that photo. But they had that photo. So, when people talk about... Um, he talked about some Muslim guy. I seen the photo later when Nick Bloomfield showed it to me. But the photo that the LAPD showed me, they got a picture of me. Puffer's in the car. I'm on the side of the car. And the Muslim guy is right there. And whoever took the picture, it had to come from the museum way. It had to come from the museum way. Because it had the side of me with Puff and the Muslim guy. Jerusalem, California. The Junior Mafia, the Disciples. Big Judas, Judas, D Rock. Damien, the devil, Diddy. This all plays out in some more psychotic. Maybe some kind of Christian form that I can I, I, I can explain to you guys, but it's it's like, yo, this shit is crazy. It's like this shit plays out just like that in my head sometimes. It plays out just like that in my head sometimes. And the fact that I'm explaining all this to this dude's, this big's mother. And tears is rolling down in her face. As I look back on my life, I know we all got a purpose. We all have something that we have to do, somewhere we have to go, something that we have to say. And 
Maybe it means something to somebody. Realize this is my story. This is what I feel. This is what I'm going to say. This is my truth. I'm not asking it to be yours. I just want you to know what I know. Thank you for giving me this time. This is Big Gene. It's Raw Deal, The Last Big Night, Cooking in Conversation. And now, the biblical betrayal of the notorious Big. Rest in peace, Big. Peace.